right, welcome back, guys. Uh, so we will be talking about Judaism today. Um, here, here's the way that this is going to work. Uh, these are just going to be video lectures to supplement uh, the work that you're doing alone. Uh, this is very difficult to try to figure out how this is all going to work. But I, I thought that these would be this would be the best way to um, get across this kind of content that I, I I'm going to have to say out loud. It's very difficult to, to write this down. Um, Without without wasting too much of my time or your time, um, but I thought so. I thought this would be the best way to kind of replicate the classroom experience. Um, and if it, now your parents get to listen in, so that's that. There's that. Um, in any case, the way that this is going to work is uh, I, I'm going to be going through the notes, um, presenting our uh, uh, different arguments, giving different discussions. Um, and in order to verify that you're actually listening to the lecture, you're not falling asleep or whatever. Um, there's going to be different questions throughout the lecture, um, not uh, not written down, just spoken out loud. And I will tell you explicitly when a question is coming up. So what you need to do is uh, listen to the question, type it up, uh, type up your response to it, and turn it in on turn it in. Um, and that will be due today at the end of March 17th. Um, that's what I want to start doing. The Yesterday I made the assignment due on Thursday just because, you know, this is the it's the first time doing this. I don't want anyone to get too far behind. Um, but, you know, with that being said, uh, we kind of have to start acting like this is regular school. So uh, imagine this is classwork. So that's why it's due the day of. Um, and so you're going to have to type it up, turn it in, turn it in, and that is due tonight. Um, in order to keep track of everything, I've created a master calendar. And you can see that it's under, uh, it's called... Um, March 16th to the 20th, and I, I, I'll be posting a Word document every day saying what the assignments are due that day, what we're what we're talking about, just kind of giving a, a brief introduction. Um, and there, there's that master calendar. So review that uh, if you need to, if you have a question about when something is due. Also, turn it in. I, I mean, I put everything that's due on turn it in. That's how we're going to be turning in every single assignment. You're not going to be emailing me anything. You're not going to be submitting in a Google Classroom, none of that. It, everything is due on turn it in. So um, that's that's a useful way for seeing when stuff is due. It'll tell you when it's due. Um, so there, there's that. And if you have a question, please email me. mflanders at cataschoolsplural.org. Um, don't, please don't comment on the Google Classroom. It, it gets, it's very difficult to keep that organized. Uh, sometimes if you have a very particular question, it's better if you just email me. So that way I can just send you a, an email back um, rather than broadcasting out to the whole class uh oftentimes some questions are very time specific so it, it i don't get those notifications but i do get notifications on my phone whenever you email me uh so please do that but with that being said uh let's go ahead and um get started so let's go back here okay um all right so let's go back over the six periods of jewish history one more time just so that way we have a very clear understanding of of, of how important this really is because the Jewish people are a people usually called a people without a home, a, a people forever on the move. And as such, they have a common history. I mean, the history is the very core, the very foundation of the Jewish people is their shared history. And just imagine how you become closer to people, not only just by blood, but by the fact that you all have, you all have memories together. It's, it's these memories which tie you and your friends, you and your family together. Um, and, and imagine that you and this entire race of people, you know, your entire religion all has one memory. You know, that's what keeps them together. So it's, there's a huge emphasis on keeping tradition alive and not just because of, for tradition's sake, but rather for the sake of keeping the kind of purity of the people together. If the Jews really are God's chosen people, as they claim, then it's very important to maintain the integrity of that. And so that's why you see throughout Jewish history um, this kind of through line, this theme of, of return, of departure and return. Departure through Adam and Eve, return through Noah, right? Departure through, rather, I mean, in a different way, Abraham, who is called out of the city, out of the city of Ur, and there he kind of wanders the desert. The Jews go back into Egypt now. And uh, so there's a return. And then there's a departure through Moses where they wander the desert, uh, 
kind of famously, this is the Exodus. And there they arrive in the Holy Land. Moses does not see it. He, uh, he, he dies before he can see the Holy Land. But then they establish the two kingdoms, Judah and Israel. Here, those are kind of return to the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. Uh, they, here it is. They've established a monarchy there. Uh, but then, oh no, they get taken away again. Um, the, Bab the Babylonians take them. Uh, this is where we get the story of Daniel and the lions. Yeah, that's from, that's from the Babylonian exile here. They come back. Uh, they create what's called the second temple. The first being established under Solomon. Um, but they create the second temple. This is where Christ will uh, talk about rebuilding it in three days. Um, the he keeps he, he keeps using masonry imagery, right? He keeps saying stuff like the cornerstone, the foundations, the bricklayers. He, he's referring to the the recent construction of the second temple, um, and then that's that, that's kind of return. And then we have a period of what's called diaspora. Here, diaspora means a kind of uh, spread. Um, the Jews often are, are spread throughout the world, so we get the kind of diasporic period, and that's why we call this modern Judaism. But what's very important throughout all of this, like I said, what's very important is that we get a feel for just how critical the history is for the Jewish people in a way that's not true of Christianity and Islam. For uh, Christianity and for Islam, I mean, the, the very center is not actually the past. I mean, there is a kind of do this remembrance of me. I mean, that, that is definitely very large. Rather, it's a kind of mission forward, right? There's a kind of evangelical nature. Uh, everyone should bend the knee to Christ. Everyone should bend the knee to Allah. Uh, and so there's a kind of forward looking. It's not necessarily about the past. It's about creating a kind of coalition, creating a kind of worldwide evangelical movement. Um, so Judaism is, is the one with, with, with a particular history that runs as a kind of through line throughout all of it. And if you go back and you actually read the Old Testament, the Old Testament is definitely a theological work, definitely philosophical, but also it's so historical. Uh, go back and read the book of Maccabees. I mean, that's that's just a historical work. Go back and read the book of um, Genesis. I mean, the entire book of Genesis is essentially one giant uh, history book uh, trying to account for uh, creation up up towards the, the lines of people. Notice why the Bible always has these long, long, long lines of this guy beget this guy beget this guy beget, the, and it just goes on because it's it's fundamentally a historical work, and and that's why um, you know, the, and that's why we think of the Bible not just as a sacred text, but also as a historical one. So there's that. The history uh, we talked about this a little bit. It's an ethnic religion. Um, there's a group of people there, you know, it's, it's the line of Abraham. And so because of this, God is understood to intervene with these people. God has chosen these people. Um, and so from, from this, we see, uh, essentially we see in, um, Judaism, an emphasis on the relationship between man and God. And what, what becomes very important is, is just the way that man has fallen, right? By, by, by his nature and the way that he is looking towards God's nature. Let's go back to the book of Genesis. Remember, uh, it talks about uh, the serpent saying that if you eat of the tree of knowledge the, of good and evil, the one that God has prohibited, he's laid a commandment. If you eat of that tree, you will become like God. Very, very important here. Talking about the very nature of God, that's 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 very important throughout the Jewish history. Um, so, before we get into that, let me just set up some context here. It's that in in Judaism, all of this stuff about the nature of God, the nature of the chosen people, that they've been promised a land, that directly affects the current socio political situation in the Middle East. Uh, and, and you should have, I think, picked up on this, maybe not thoroughly, but picked up on this when we read the Israel-Palestinian conflict. That conflict runs all the way back to Abraham. It, it, whenever, whenever God promises to Abraham a land, he promised to him a, a line of descendants, which will be as numerous as the stars. That promise, that covenant, is exactly the one which the British and the Americans believed they were kind of fulfilling 
uh, during the Balfour Declaration, whenever they actually gave uh, the Jews the land called Palestine, they created the state of Israel in 1945, that they are referencing the biblical tradition here. So what we're talking about today, it's not just something about, oh, what these people have to believe. Rather, it's it's currently a lively debate, which is leading to uh, one, of, one of the most kind of violent conflicts the world has seen, uh, at, at least in the modern period. And by that, I mean, at least in the, the second half of the 21st century, I'm sorry, the 20th century into our period today, um, the period of violence between the Israelis and the Palestinians something which every president since at least Carter has tried to solve. So it's very important that we understand the very nature of God here. Um, that's where we're going to talk about, let's, before we get to this, let's talk about the nature of God. Um, okay. God in the Old Testament, right? Remember that, that the Old Testament is, in fact, the kind of major works of the Torah, the prophets, so we get Ezekiel, uh, Zechariah, Haggai, all of the prophets, and then a lot of the, the writings, a lot of these done by minor prophets like Daniel. Um, Job is a kind of, it's actually a play. It's actually meant to be a Jewish play. Uh, the Proverbs, the Psalm, the Psalms written by David, um, the Song of Solomon written by Solomon. So a lot of just like writings by important Jewish figures. Um, so, the, you know, there's that. That's the Old Testament. And throughout the Old Testament, God is a very different God than uh, in the New Testament, which is what a lot of Christians are used to. It's very different than Allah in the uh, as presented in the Quran. So the God of the Old Testament is, um, his name is Yahweh. Okay, so let's, let's, let's do this. His name is uh, Yahweh. Okay, what this translates to, it depends on, on, it depends on the translation you read the best translation I've seen is from it's something called the Douay Reims Bible. Anyway, it's it's translated as this. Not or other translations are I am who I am and I I am that I am. Think about the difference between these two. Okay, so Yahweh is the name of God as revealed to Moses in um, Exodus. 314. God is talking to Moses. This is where Moses is getting his vocation uh, to go and rapture uh, the Jewish people and free them from their captivity in Egypt. And so in this kind of historical moment, God is talking to Moses and Moses, he says, you know, go to Egypt. Uh, Moses asks for his name. He says, who, who shall I send them? Uh, say, who shall I say sent me to you? And here's what God responds. He says he reveals himself as I am who am. Very, very important. Very important. This is God revealing himself to Moses, at least as the Jews understand um, what's, who, who God is. Because if you understand who God is, you can understand a little bit about what he does and what he wants. Right? Just like I understand who you are, I understand a little bit about what 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 do you want right what like what are your commandments what do you value what do you condemn what do you prohibit and what do you uh smile upon what what do you like so it's very important we understand uh why this is a good translation why these are are good but not the best so let's 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 investigate this further okay when when god reveals himself as i am who am I mean, first off, what does this mean, right? What does it mean to be an am, right? I am who, like, like for example, we, this is the object of the sentence, okay? This is the subject. So I am, and it's going to take what we typically call a predicate nominative, but it's not. It's actually, it's, 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 it's taking um, the object of the sentence here. I am who am, okay? We typically say, like, for example, I say, I am Matthew. I am something. Matthew helps define who I am. Now, what he's saying here is, I am that person. This, remember, is the verb to be. I am a person which is. In another way, he might say, I am, uh, to put it in Latin, we might say, ipsum esse. I am existence itself. This is how the Jews in Jewish theology 
understand um, God as existence itself. And so what that really translates to, and if, so for those of you in fourth hour, we kind of went over this, but I'll go over this again. I think it's, I think it's very important you understand this. This is going to harken back to uh, the Aristotelian argument uh, from motion. Aristotle, uh, he is a Greek philosopher. Uh, important, he is not a theologian. He, he never he never encountered the ancient Jewish sources. He never read uh, Moses. He never read the the Old Testament. And so, what that gets what they really gets at is that the fact that Aristotle, as we're going over it, he's he actually arrives at a similar conception of the very nature of God, a God that is uh, similar. Yahweh becomes Jehovah becomes Allah. They are all three of the same God. At least they're talking about the same thing in Hebrew. Uh, Latin and in uh, Arabic. The very nature of God that is revealed to, you know, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad uh, is a very similar type of thing to what is um, found by Aristotle. And, and this is an interesting way of saying uh, Aristotle happened upon this. He found upon uh, God and, and to set up the problem a little bit further, it's that a lot of Jews would argue that this is impossible. You know, what, what, what the Jews would argue is that the, the holiness of this name, the, 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 the sacredness, is derived from the fact that it is revealed, that man could not have known it. If man could know it by himself, well, then what we're saying is that man has an incredible amount of power. I mean, man has the power of his mind to reach and, and kind of steal away this idea of God, to think about it, to, to, to wrap the mind around it. Um, and, and, and for Jews, and actually for Muslims as well, um, the idea of wrapping your mind around God is something which, rather than uplifting man, is something which humbles God. Uh, and and, and that's, not, that's not to be good, at least not in the Jewish or Muslim context. It's, it's to say that, imagine if you were to think of a mountain, right? Re really think about that mountain. Y your mind is at its, its at its furthest limits. It can't really stretch its way around it, right? Uh, you can't think of every pebble, every blade of grass, every tree, every squirrel, every whatever. You know, everything on that mountain, you can't really think of it. Y in your mind, you have this hazy image because a mountain is so big. Now imagine how much grander God is. So uh, for the Jews and for the Muslims, the, very, the idea of wrapping your mind around God, of thinking about God, is not possible because of just how grand, just how infinite God is. Uh, that a limited mind cannot wrap itself around an infinite reality. That's, that's the idea here. But nevertheless, Aristotle uh, charges on anyway. And here's the argument. The argument is... Uh, and th th this is not word for word. This is me kind of summarizing Aristotle here. It's that Aristotle argues that everything, uh, everything essentially is in motion. And by motion here, motion does not translate to uh, well. Let me let me kind of do this. Right. So, motion we're talking about is a movement from a potential existence to an actual existence. So what, 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 what do we mean by that? Well, what we mean is that what is motion, okay, if not the movement from some potential to some sort of actual, right? A, a marker is potentially on the ground when it's 10 feet up, and then when I drop it, it is actually on the ground, okay? So we say that the marker has potential. It only has certain potential. The marker can't fly up in the sky, right? It ha it has it has a certain potential, and that potential kind of limits it where it can go, and then it can move to any one of those. It can become actual in any one of those. So that's why Aristotle says everything is in motion, and what he's saying is that everything is constantly moving from potential to actual, right? Things are potentially somewhere, and then they are actually somewhere. And the only way that you can move actually somewhere is if you had that possibility, right? How do I know that I had a possibility where I, I'm, I'm here right now, right? I could potentially be at bird, but I'm not. I'm at my house because I have to be. <laughs> so there's a potential to be somewhere, and then there's actually where I am. 
So Aerosol argues everything is in motion. And from this, he, 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 he says, well, uh, everything uh, which moves is moved by another. So something can't actualize itself. Think about, for example, I, I potentially was. There was a point in time in history where I was not. Okay, uh, in the 13th century, I was not. In 2020, I am, right? I, I exist now and I didn't exist then. There, I, but I potentially did. I potentially existed and now I do. So what he's saying here is that everything which moves from a potential to an actual is moved by another thing. So my parents, my parents moved me from potential to actual. Their parents moved them, their parents moved them. And Aristotle says, well, wait, this line of movers to moved cannot go infinitely back. What he's saying here is that the line of mover to moved, you, you can't go infinitely back. So let me, let me see how I'm going to say this. It's that if it could, if it could go infinitely back, well, then what we're saying is that that, that it, we're, we're looking at it kind of backwards. We're saying from where I am, I can go back and back and back and back. But if you look at it the way history actually moves, which is forward, you know, history is not retroactive. Think about it moving forward. At any point in time which you stop, there's always something to, to go back towards. And, and, and that, what that means is that nothing actually has caused this thing. It, it was potentially caused, and then has to be caused by something further. So what he's saying is that it's, it's actually a logical impossibility um, and this is something too, actually, I, I, I feel is, um, actually, uh, supported by, by most mathematicians. They'll, they'll argue that, that infinities do not actually exist. They, they exist in the mind. They are potential infinities, but they are not actual infinities. So what that's to say is that if this line of movers cannot go back infinitely, well, then QED conclusion, there exists something we don't know what it is but there's just something which moves so it moves others without itself being moved he is this is what he'll call the unmoved mover very important the unmoved mover something which moves without himself being moved and remember motion is talking about an actuality right he is unmoved meaning he has no potential. If I cannot move, I have no potential to go anywhere. So what we're saying is something without potential, something totally actual. This, something later, a guy named Thomas Aquinas, he will take this argument and he'll say, well, look, this unmoved mover, he'll push it further and say, this potential, right? If he has, if he cannot move, he has no potential. He is pure actuality. He'll call this unmoved mover. He'll say, wait, that's the same thing as actus purus, pure actuality, nothing but actuality, nothing but existence, existence itself. We arrive at the same idea of ipsum esse, I am who am. And this is the great line that connects Aristotle, the pagan world, and the Jewish world. And it's right here. I am who am to this idea of an ipsum esse, of an unmoved mover. And look, this is this is very complicated. So if, if I, I would go back and I'd rewatch that part of the lecture, make sure you really understand it. Because here's question one. Question one. What does Yahweh mean? What just what is the meaning of Yahweh in Hebrew? And secondly, what is the significance of saying I am who am? I want you to tell me what does it matter that God is, in a Jewish context, this unmoved mover, something with no potential, okay? He, he is pure existence. I want you to tell me what is the significance here? If, if, in fact, God is this unmoved mover, what does that tell us about the nature of God? What does that tell us about how God is and how God operates, okay? That is really the first question. What does Yahweh mean? And then also, what is the significance of uh, I am? 
Okay, so now let's keep going with the lecture real quick. So that way we can get to uh, this, this here. Uh, not, not, not this, not this, not this. Let's go to humans. The problem of man is, like I said, it's the problem of uh, failure. It's the problem of leaving, of departing. And it's not, it's not a God f forcing a departation. Rather, it's man electing to, to suffer, right? It's that humans have free will, right? In a Jewish context, and according to Jewish theology, man has free will. And, and from that free will, um, man, apparently, Adam and Eve, the first man, the first woman, had uh, suffered because they had chosen against God. They had, they had not taken care of, of the garden. They had listened to the, uh, or not listened, rather, to the prohibition of eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so, very importantly here, right, very important, let's go back and remember that the serpent actually argues that if you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will become like God. And just, 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 rem what does that mean? Well, to the Jews and to the Christians which will follow them, um, to become like God is to author, to be the author of right and wrong. Okay, if God is in fact ipsumese, if He is uh, all knowing, all loving, all good, He is the author of what's right and the author of what's wrong. I mean, He laid out very clear condemnations and very clear prohibitions. Um, and so, to become like God is to know good and evil, and to create what's good and evil. And so, think about yourself. Think think about how how many times you are the one who thinks I know what's right. I will do what's right, right? And maybe you're wrong in that, but nevertheless, you have your own conception of what you think is right and what you think is wrong. And it's because you have free will that you can do that. It's because that you can think, that, that you can move beyond the here and now, that you can think about the future. You can think about potentially where you want to be, and you can push yourself where in, in any direction, right? You, you have an incredible, uh, incredible amount of, of, of responsibility but from that responsibility comes a kind of nobility. Think about here, God created man in his image, meaning a soul and a body united, a mind which can operate outside of the here and now. So I'm looking at my cat right now, and that animal uh, cannot think in any other terms other than the here and now. He sniffs something, he moves towards it. He sees food, he's thinking about food, right? My cat never sits down and ponders and says, hmm, what am I to do today? You know, what, what, what is best for me? What is best for others? Because a cat simply can't do that by, by the fact that its body is limited and it doesn't have what's called a, a rational soul. We'll, we'll get into that probably next lecture, what that means. But nevertheless, it's that because you have, in Jewish theology, a, uh, a rational soul, you can have decisions. And you can make good decisions or you can make bad decisions. And so, you know, that's the problem for man is man making bad decisions. Um, and, and so that suffering comes from rebellion, right? Adam and Eve rebelling from God and, and therefore becoming like him. I mean, they, they are now the authors of good and evil. We are all the authors of, uh, authors of good and evil. And that, that therein lies the great problem is now that mankind so in according to the jewish kind of uh story the kind of myth of the um of, of the garden um in, in 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 think about the characters in in this story right think about the very nature of adam and eve adam means man he's talking about mankind right and so you have the first man not listening to god's commandments and so from that we are now all apparently tainted by original sin, by this idea of sinning against God, okay? And what that really translates to is that sin is not the same thing as doing something wrong, okay? the In Buddhism, they have a clear conception of right and wrong, right? Right is to give up desire. In Hinduism, you have a right and wrong. In Hinduism, it's doing right is doing your dharma, and that's, that's based on your caste. But sin is you are sinning against something. You are sinning against a God. You are sinning against another person, right? So we have oftentimes in the Bible referring to, I have sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you, 
right? Talking about to like, like another person. Um, that's the story of the prodigal son, the story of return. And that's exactly what this is. I mean, this is, in fact, a, a uh, promise of a Messiah. And the word Messiah, it means anointed one. Uh, Messiah translates to uh, really a kind of savior figure. So is Jesus Christ the Messiah? I, I, I cannot say that being uh, <laughs> being a public school teacher, uh, and I'm not going to weigh in on that. Uh, a lot of people have weighed in on that, on that question. Um, but nevertheless, Christ, uh, J Jesus of Nazareth, understands himself to be the Messiah. I mean, he understands himself within a context of Jewish history uh, as a fulfillment of Scripture, a fulfillment of a promise. And so go back. Let's go back to the books of the Bible here, um, or the books of the, oh, sorry, the, the, the ancient texts. You know, notice how there are history, and they have a lot of commandments, but then they have so many prophets. I mean, the Old Testament is littered with these guys, right? All these prophets, which are talking about um, the, the coming of the Messiah, right? The the end days when man will finally be reunited with uh, God. And so that's that's the great importance of this guy, Moses here, is this is the first time that, that the Jews are actually being called back into God. He creates a new covenant, right? So the the my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? That's that's to be gone, right? God is no longer to forsake his people. He is to bring them back. So the Jews live in a kind of waiting period, right? They're waiting for the Messiah. Mirroring, I think very important here, mirroring the the waiting of the um, Christians, right? Christians are, are, are waiting for the second coming of Christ. Um so, you know, there's, there's, there's that. But the main idea here is that rebellion is uh, what led to the expulsion from the garden. And the garden being a kind of period of harmony between man and God. And now there is uh, a kind of dissonance, a kind of, a kind of uh, dissonant chord that's, that's been wrung out and it's continuing to echo is, is man leaving uh, God in the Garden of Eden. So, uh, you know, there's, there, there's that. So the second question, uh, what I'm asking here is, uh, so the second question, what is the Messiah in the Jewish context? Okay, so what is the um, what is the point of a Messiah? Why do they need a Messiah in Judaism? Uh, and so if you want to go further, you might say, why does, why does Jesus Christ call himself this? Why does he call himself a Messiah, right? Um, so let's go down to, okay, last thing, last thing before we, we close for the day is Passover. And we've already talked about it a little bit before um, in class. We'll probably talk about it uh, at length um, when we get to Christianity uh, and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Is uh, Passover is one of these periods of the Jews fulfilling God's commandments, you know, staying true to it, pushing, putting the blood over the doorstep of the unblemished lamb, eating what's called the Seder meal, um, this unleavened bread, it's called matzah. It's right here. I'm not sure if you can see it. It's matz matzah. Here's the lamb. Um, and here's the bitter herbs over here. Uh, staying true to that commandment is what leads to um, the Jews uh, uh, kind of coming back, you know, being saved from the angel of death. Remember, death enters the world after, uh, after the first sin. And here they are being saved from death by fulfilling his commandments. So there's a kind of lyrical uh, poetry, a kind of lyrical rhyme between these two events, Genesis and Exodus. You know, the, these two, these two very important books. You see a lot of symbols reoccurring. Um, in this, in this, and then we're gonna have once again here this reoccurring symbol of the lamb, the unblemished lamb, who is a sacrifice. So just kind of as hints towards the future, it that's it's no coincidence that Jesus Christ will call himself uh, the lamb, uh, the Agnus Dei. Right. Let me go. Let me write it down. The uh, Agnus Dei, which translates to uh, the Lamb of God. Right. So the Lamb, which was sacrificed in order to prevent the Jews from dying. Now we're talking about Christ being the Lamb of God to prevent all of us from death, at least as as far as Christianity is concerned. So um, the point of separation between these two, right, is um, is who is waiting for the Messiah? You know, Christianity, Christians are not waiting for the Messiah. Neither is Islam. 
but Jews are. I mean, so whenever Christ appears, let's go back to the, the timeline. Um, when Jesus Christ arrives on the stage here at, uh, here, right, in, in right after the second temple is built, you know, some, some Jews, some Jews actually uh, uh, believe him. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, uh, Theophilus, uh, you know, all, all, all of the disciples. I mean, they were all Jews believing in, in, in that, that Christ was a kind of fulfillment of Scripture. So oftentimes in the Bible, it, 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 they call back to the works of Isaiah, one of the prophets, or they'll call back to Zechariah or Haggai or, or Malachi. Um, so some Jews believe that Christ was the Messiah, right? Fulfillment of Judaism, the kind of natural end of the story, and some don't, right? Some believe that uh, some Jews, the Jews who are still around, uh, believe that, no, they're still waiting for the Messiah. They're still waiting for man and God to be brought back. And what's really important is that it's about staying true to those commandments, staying true to the commandments of God. And there's about 613 of these things, right? About 613 what's called mitzvot, or uh, uh, commandments. 258 positives, thou shalt. 365 negatives, thou shalt not, right? So staying true to these commandments is what led to the Jews being saved at Passover, right, at, at, uh, during the kind of climax of the exodus story um and so that's why they have to keep these commandments alive that's why jews are often seen as being very orthodox being very um some some i've heard them called being like zealots but i would not call them that i would i would say that the better word would be very orthodox staying true to the tradition staying true to the commandments because it's only from that it's only from this kind of obedience that you get the reward of the afterlife the reward of um, heaven. But if you are not part of God's, you know, chosen people, or even if you are, and you have not been obedient, remember, like Adam and Eve, like, uh, David, uh, kind of lusting after Bathsheba, like, um, you know, Judas, for example, uh, if you are disobedient, you will be punished. And if you are obedient, you'll be rewarded. So there's a strong emphasis, not just on the history, but a history of commands, a history of covenants, history of promises. And the biggest one is the promise of a Messiah. So uh, the last question, last question before we uh, leave off for today is what is Passover? Just describe for me what is Passover? What is the point of Passover? As in um, why why did you celebrate it every single year? Think about the what we just talked about with tradition. Um, and then the, the kind of from that. So, so the question is what is Passover? What's its significance? Uh, for the Jews, and lastly, what I want to say, or what I, the the question is, um, why do Jews do this every year? Why do so? So it's it's the easy answer is that they're doing it to remember the Exodus. I want you to go further. Tell me why is it the case that Jews follow this commandment so religiously, right? Why do they follow it with everything they have? They've done Passover since the time of the Exodus. Okay. Uh, and that's a, that's about it for Judaism. Uh, we're we're going to pick up with Christianity um, uh, probably next lecture. That'll be a Thursday. Uh, so remember those three questions that we have. Um, you're going to have to answer them. I'd say complete sentences, more than one complete sentence. Uh, this is going to be about 10 points, but 10 points every single day, that adds up. Uh, so I, I, I would not say you should just... I don't know, just, just try and wait to the last minute, try try to do it at midnight. I mean, you're, you're asking for trouble. I, uh, you're asking for, for complications and the internet going down, and it's very, very interesting times we live in. So I would say try and stay on top of it. Try and uh, I'm going to have hopefully everything posted by, by noon every single day. That's, that's my goal. Um, and so then you can have the second half of the day, or at the very least, this should be up by 11 o'clock today. Um, Try, try, try to have everything done so that way you can spend time doing whatever you want. But, you know, just get your homework done first. Um, I think I think that this is a very interesting time for we all to, especially being seniors, to practice uh, online classes. So with that being said, uh, make sure that you actually uh, answer the questions and uh, turn it in on Turn It In by midnight tonight. And I will see you all later. Please stay safe.